Dear students, good morning. This is a class for April 1st, uh, 2020. So, um, on Monday, uh, we started off with uh, reviewing Leach's, um, Leach's maxims. And then I gave you a sort of test, self-assessment test, that you could use to review whatever we, uh, all the things that we've done, we've done uh, that we did in March. Um, about pragmatics because we are slowly getting in towards the end of the pragmatics book and getting then uh, into the semantics book. I warn you, semantics, the semantics book is definitely more difficult than this one and it's not an April's Fool. Um, but let's get into uh, the correction of your test and if you have any questions or you think that the answer is different from the one that I'm telling you that I'm giving you please send me a message uh, either in the comment box below or in um, via email and I'll be glad to discuss uh, to discuss that uh, with you because there can be several answers to one question let's move on so number one in the utterance, Mary kissed that boy yesterday. That boy and yesterday are both examples of dictic expressions. Okay, that boy, a pers uh, personal dixis, and yesterday, time. When speakers use net proper nouns, proper names, nouns, and pronouns to talk about people, places, times, etc., that is an act of reference. We haven't talked about this one before, so um, it's okay if you didn't know how to answer it. It's something more pertaining to semantics, uh, but uh, probably you've already heard of it uh, about it, and so you knew the answer. Number three. In the utterance, he came home late last night. Came is an example of... Um, I put place, okay, because came just like that out of the blue out of context does not have a reference point does not have a point of reference okay. so that's why i chose place number four which of the following utterances performs a speech act indirectly uh, i gave you Letter C, it's so hot in here. Okay. Because you want some, probably this person wants somebody else to open the window for them. And again, same typo, let me correct it. Number five, when a husband, when a husband says to his wife, pass me the bread, sweetheart, he is performing an, a speech act by showing consideration for his wife's positive face because he says sweetheart, okay? So that little sweetheart over there is um, referring to the person's positive face. Not to his negative face because, uh, because it is not respecting her independence, okay? Number six, speakers use hedges, B, to qualify their statements when unsure about something. Okay, let's say that a person so, says, as far as I know, uh, the guy never left the room. That as far as, as far as I know, is trying to qualify the statement because this person is unsure about what they are saying. They are not saying, "I know that the guy is over there." They're saying, "As far as I know, that's a hedge." That means that you are using a hedging, hedging technique. Or, um, it could also be D uh, to avoid telling the truth when unsure about something. Okay, it could either be B or D. Number seven, positive face is letter C, the image that every society member wants to claim for him or herself. Okay, then 
Um, okay. Sorry for the interruption. Um, where was I? Well, maybe the sentence is a little... No, wait a second. Yes, the sentence is a little misleading because this wouldn't be neither negative nor positive uh, face, but actually just the image that everybody, every uh, society member wants to claim for themselves. It were So the sentence is a little misleading. It should be just face. Number eight. The four maxim propo maxims proposed by Grice must be followed in order to, for communication to be successful. And number nine, which of the following is the oppressive position of Mary does not regret buying books via the internet again? The sentence made you, little, made you think a little, and the answer is B, that she has bought uh, books via the internet in the past. Why is it not D? Because there's the word again. The second uh, exercise now um, was more based on definitions. And so, number one, your public self-image, the emotional and social sense of self, that everyone has and expects everyone else to recognize. Okay, this is clearly face. Number two, the need to be connected, to belong, to be a member of a group. This is positive face. No problems with this one either. Number three, subsequent reference to an already introduced entity. Referring back, like Paul's on the phone, I don't want to talk to him. This is an anaphora, okay? Because him is referring to something that has already been mentioned previously. Paul. Oh. Number four uses a typical syntactic form uh, when an interrogative structure is used with the function of a question. Can you ride a bike? This is a direct speech act. Okay? Because the question um, uses the, the structure, the pattern of a question, and the intended meaning behind it is a question. So it's a direct speech act. Um, and then number five, used to point to things, it's this, these, um, and people, him, them, those. We built this city on rock and roll, it was an example of personal deuxis. And then number six, our interpretation of the meaning of the sign is not based solely on the blank, but on what we think the writer intended to communicate. Our interpretation of the word of the of the meaning of the sign is not based solely um, so based solely on words, but on what we think the writer is intended to communicate. Number seven, used to point to a time, now, then, last year. And this is temporal deuxis. Number eight, it uses a, an atypical syntactic form. Using a structure associated with the function of a request, um, of a request. So you left the door open means that I'm using a structure that does not actually mean what I want. Um, I say it as a statement, you left the door open, what I want that person is to close the door. So I'm doing an indirect speech act.
Number nine. When there is something more to or something different from the literal meaning that is conveyed. We explain these situations using pragmatics because we go beyond the meaning of the literal, the literal meaning of what we are saying. Number 10. Hope you enjoy the background music. Uh, number 10. The need to be independent and feel from imposition. This is a negative face. Finally, 11. Um, reverses the antecedent and after a relationship by beginning with the pronoun and then later revealing more specific information. It suddenly appeared, an enormous grizzly bear. Uh, this is clearly a cataphora. It's the opposite of anaphora. Number 12. If you say something that represents a threat to somebody's uh, person's self-image, like give, give me that paper, you are doing a face-threatening act. And then, number 13, whenever you say something that lessens the possible threat to another person's face, you are doing a face-saving act. Okay, remember, face-threatening and face-saving. And then 14, uh, actions such as requesting, commanding, questioning, or informing, um, the action performed by a speaker with an utterance is a speech act. So that's the end of the um, test that we did on Monday. Uh, it's just the occasion to go back to the main concepts that we studied during the month of March. Um, and, you know, keeping everything in track and um, everything under control. If you have any comments or questions that you did not understand, uh, if you want an explanation for what I said, just uh, write me a comment and I'm glad to help. I'll skip the sentence transformations that you will definitely do with your mother tongue teachers. Uh, probably we'll go back to them later on if you want to do some exercises, but for now we'll skip them. And ta-da! We are getting into the section, the second uh, section of your book. For those of you who have the book, uh, you you can realize that I'm skipping uh, parts of it, uh, as I did last year. Um, again, if you don't have the book, it's not a problem. Just follow the slides. And um, so we're going to go into the section that is called development, analyzing discourse in context. Um, this part of the this part of the of the course shows you how to do text analysis uh, with some concrete examples. Um, but just to before we get uh, before we get into this, I want you to pause the video now and watch this first video about what does your language style say about you. It's a TED talk, uh, 15 minutes, and it uh, is basically about how language changes. And this is a matter not only of um, written texts, but also oral texts. The purpose of this video put here is not only to take a break from the test that we were doing before, but also to give you these little inputs into how pragmatics is part of our life and um, how pragmatics helps us um, be more aware of what is going on linguistically around us. So please pause the video and go to the link, the first link that you see in your uh, comment box. Thank you. Okay, good. So I hope you enjoyed that and I really invite you to uh, think about two two things over there. One, we can't stop language change. And what you are saying today is totally different from what teenagers are saying and how they use language. And a plus for women, uh, women, women are um, statistically more innovative in their language. Um, I was having this, this conversation with, um, like, uh, I had, um, I worked with them with the US military and there was this, um, this daughter uh, of a soldier, and she was saying, she's 14 years old, 
So uh, she was telling me about, we were talking about ling linguistics and I was, um, uh, I was just describing the course that I'm doing with you and with uh, Asia and Africa. And um, she got in, she's a very intelligent kid. I love her. And she was saying, well, you know, with um, millennials, she's, she's 14. So um, we, we like texting a lot, which is not the texting that I used to do with my SMSs, but something that they do through WhatsApp. And she said she was talking about um, some very interesting changes in, um, in language that they use at that age. And um, she was referring to how they call friends. And if I got it correctly, when two boys are really good friends, they call each other bro, bro, like brother. But the thing that happens with girls is they don't call themselves sisters. They call themselves bras. So there's bra, that is bro brother, and bra, that is like the equivalent of what we would expect for sister. And... Um, uh, then what did she say? Oh, okay. She was talking about, um, very male that are very good friends are in a bromance. That is the combination, you know, the clipping of the word brother and romance. And they kind of joke with, it's, it's a word that they use to, to joke, but also they're, they're quite serious in it because uh, they say to say that they are very good friends. They would say that they are in uh, romance, and um, obviously she was just a teenager and uh, not uh, studying linguistics yet. Even if uh, I think she'll go very far in her life, but still, um, obviously she couldn't realize that that sister and brother was coming probably from the African American community. Uh, or perhaps we can say something further than that, that um, that usage of brother and sister is no longer linked socially only to the African-American community, but it has gone further and it is now assessed, it is now used also by people who do not even realize where that word comes from. Okay, it's getting into, um, uh, it wasn't your course, but with Asia and Africa, uh, we were talking about um, multi multicultural uh, England, and um, and so this is just to show you how a usage, um, the knowledge of pragmatics, could e easily explain what's going on with American teenagers. And we've all done it, by the way. I mean, every every generation has had has had its own trends. What does this mean? That we cannot stop language change. And um, for people who study linguistics, this should be like um, very interesting and enlightening. But anyway, sorry for getting off the tangent there. Uh, let's go. Let's go back to section B of your um, of your course. And uh, there's this first text that we're going to analyze together that is called, How Are Things Going? Uh, we're going to, I'm going to read this dialogue. It's pretty long and we'll go back and forth with it. But AF is a Scottish woman and she gets into an office and she wants to see CM, that is a Canadian man. And there's also DM, that is an English man. And the English man hands the curtains down in his room. Later on, they are joined by BM and MM, that are other two Englishmen. So I'll slowly read this first part of their dialogue. God, it's hot in here. Is it? Yeah, really. Are you shutting out this lovely sunshine? It's getting in my eyes. Oh, no. Yeah, not used to that, are you? No. What's that? Psycholinguistics? Mm-hmm. I have difficulty getting my brain going first thing in the morning. She certainly fills it up, doesn't she? She's got lots of things to tell you, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Ugh. 
I'm a terrible reader. Um, oh, I just want to sit down. You going to get on your bike? Have you got to go? Yeah, I suppose I have. I shouldn't this morning. Yeah, right. M and M. Uh, B, M, enter the room. Anyone, anyone got the key to the photocopier? Nope. Is it still not there? Oh, M, M. I brought the, the what's, what's the name back? Yeah. Tell you what. Something unintelligible. How are you? All right. I haven't seen you very much. No, I haven't seen you very much. We must not fit at all. You do, you do language planning, don't you? Yeah, I've stopped doing that, though. Are you, um, are you going to do what you thought you'd do about your project? I'm going to give out a questionnaire, and I'll give you one as well. Sometimes this week, I hope, t mm, I hope tomorrow, and I'll get them all done. What, your core project? Yeah. Mm. Did he, did he like the idea? Well, you know what he's like. It's difficult to tell, isn't it? Yeah, he said it wasn't terrible anyway. He said, go ahead, so I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, he said this isn't terrible. No, he didn't tell me that. Okay. Beyond my reading and playing out skills, let's look at the text analysis, the guided textual analysis. For this text, your book decided to analyze the context. And so it got into the situational context. Remember that situational context is what is immediately going around the two people who are talking. Two, three, however, how many people are talking. In lines from one through seven, uh, one person says, God, God, it's hot in here. And so here is an example of place de exist. The same thing can be said for, are you shutting out this lovely sunshine? Again, this Place de exist. Or what's that at line seven? Psycholinguistic. Psycholinguistics. In all these cases, you can only understand what the words here, this, or that are referring to if you look at the context that is immediately surrounding, immediately around the people who are talking. Okay? I mean, you can get it from the context, but in general, uh, some things are quite self-intuitive, but still, it is linked to the situation that these people share. Okay, especially a good example here is what's that? Okay, you can fit, you can almost imagine the person pointing at something. Probably a psycholinguistics book. Now, let's look at the cultural background, so knowledge that is shared by all the people who are um, participating in the dialogue. The first one says, She's certain, she certainly fills it up, doesn't she? Sorry, there's a typo there. The correct sentence is, she certainly fills it up, doesn't she? And we're here. Let me go back to the text. Sorry. Okay, so they're talking about getting their brain working in the morning, and then DM says, she certainly fills it up, doesn't she? She's got lots of things to tell you, I'm sure. Okay. From the context, we can guess that they are talking about a teacher, just like me, probably putting way too much information into their classes. Um, and so she fills it up. She has a very dense class. We know that when students are talking about filling something up in these type of contexts, they're talking about the professor. 
and how much information she gives within two hours. Then something that would be more perhaps pertaining to the situational context, but anyway, your textbook puts it here, um, is what is said in line 17 through 20. At a certain point, there is uh, two people who come in. There are two people who come in and say, anybody got the key to the photocopier? They all know what photocopier they are talking about. Okay, it's probably something that they share, a photocopier that they share. And they know that you need a key to start the photocopier. Lines 36 to 42. Uh, you're going to get on your bike. This person, this sentence implies certainly that um, the speaker knows that the other person is not to, going to go upstairs. They are probably going to leave the area. Interpersonal background context. Uh, we'll look at the dialogue in a second. Lines 19 to 21, when the other person says, oh, M.M., -M, because they had a previous conversation about M.M. Um, -M that wanted A.F. to bring something back. Let's go back to the context over here, 19. Okay, so... Um, Okay, yes, they were talking about the, the key to the photocopier. And then AF says to AM, is it still not there? Oh, MM, I brought the, what, the, what's the, what's the name back? Yeah, tell you what. And then they go on to conversation, to another part of the conversation. Um, what does this mean? that there is some interpersonal background context, something going on that is not explicitly uh, said in the text. More than the first example, what could be a better example of this interpersonal um, background knowledge is contained in you, is included in lines from 24 to 28, when one person says, we must not fit at all. Um, let's go back to the text over here. Sorry, I might be making you diz dizzy. Uh, dizzy, sorry. Um, I haven't seen you very much. No, I haven't seen you very much. We must not fit at all. Uh, you do, you do language planning, don't you? What does this mean? What does this mean that must not fit at all? We can understand that probably these people were taking the same classes and then at a certain point they decided to do different classes. And so they never meet, they never fit, they never do the same things, they never, they never um, encounter themselves, they, they never meet up uh, between one class and another. That's what that uh, we, we don't fit at all means. Or... Lines 36 to 41, did he like the idea, refers to a previous talk. So did he like, did he like the idea? The idea. So he doesn't express any further uh, information about the idea because they both know what they are referring to. Well, you know what he's like. It's difficult to tell, isn't it? Okay, so... Uh, the idea being the definite article makes you think that there is something that has not been um, included in this text, but that both people know, know of. Um, the problem is that uh, with interpersonal context, it is very difficult to understand what two people are talking about um, if you do not know the context. Okay, here is pretty easy because... Uh, we're in a student's context, we are all pretty familiar with that type of thing, but if, um, if the, the dialogue were to be about something 
different, that is not that context, it could be uh, a little difficult to follow, to understand. So far, we um, discussed about context. Now, with the second sample, uh, we are going to analyze co-text. This text is from Between the Acts by Virginia Woolf, so I'm going to slowly read it for you. It was a summer's night, and they were talking, in the big room, with the windows open to the garden, about the pool. The county council had promised to bring water to the village, but they Mrs. Haynes, the wife of the gentleman farmer, a goose-faced woman with eyes protruding as if they saw something to gobble in the gutter, said affectedly, What a subject to talk about on a night like this. Then there was silence, and a, co a cow coughed. And that led her to say how odd it was, as a child, she had never feared cows, only horses. But then, as a small child in a perambulator, a great cart horse had brushed within an inch of her face. Her family, she told the old man in the armchair, had lived near uh, Liskard for many centuries. There were the graves in the churchyard to prove it. A bird chuckled outside. A nightingale? asked Mrs. Haynes. No, nightingales didn't come so far north. It was a daylight bird, chuckling over the substance and succulence of the day, over worms, sm snails, grit, even in sleep. The old man in the armchair, Mr. Oliver, of the Indian Civil Service, retired, said that the site they had chosen for the cesspool was, if he had heard all right, on the Roman road. From an airplane, he said, you could still see, plainly marked, the scars made by the Britons, by the Romans, by the Elizabethan manor house, and by the plow, when they plowed, uh, plowed sorry, the hill to grow wheat in the Napo Na Napoleonic Wars. Okay, I know that I went a little fast and so you need to read it silently. You can pause the video and go to your slides if you, if you prefer to just look up the vocabulary that you need, perhaps. But in the first case text, we, in the first text, in the first um, example, we uh, analyzed situ context, situational, cultural, and interpersonal context. Now, another thing that you can do is analyze the text from uh, the point of view of cohesion. So, let's look at some cases of endophoric reference that are used within this text. In lines 2 and 3, Virginia Woolf wrote, the, the county council had promised to bring the water to the village, but they hadn't, okay? They being an anaphoric reference to the county council, okay? the people of the county council. Or lines four and five, when Mrs. Haynes, the wife of the gentleman farmer, a goose-faced woman with eyes protruding as if they saw something to gobble in the gutter. They, and for reference to this woman's eyes. Or, sent, or the lines seven through eight, when then there was silence and a cow coughed, and that led her to say how odd it was as a child, she had never feared cows, only uh, horses. Uh, we'll get back to that only horses thing in a while, but that her refers to Mrs. Haynes. Or her family, she told the old man in the armchair, had lived near uh, Liskard for many centuries, where the old man is referring um, to something that she will explain later on, um, in the text, and so this is a cataphoric reference.
Getting into categoric reference, by the way, in line number one and two, it was a summer night and they were talking in the big room with the windows open to the garden about, about the cesspool. In this case, this they that you see over here, they were talking, is categoric reference to something that will be explained later. So there's, um, there's the narrator and other people who are in the room that will be described later on. Another element that um, we studied at, during the beginning, of the, at the beginning of the course was ellipsis. And in line two and three, we can see an example of it, where uh, the county council had promised to bring water to the village, but they hadn't, okay? But they hadn't removes part of the sentence, okay? To bring water to the village. Or an even better example at lines seven and eight. That led her to say how odd it was, as a child, she had never feared cows, only horses. In this case, the ellipsis is removing, she feared only horses, okay? So she feared is removed to end only horses is left. Or line 13, a bird chuckled outside, a nightingale? In this case, the question, a uh, rhetorical question, totally removes all the instances of verbs. Instead of saying, was it a nightingale, it just says a nightingale, and that creates a structure of cohesion within the text from a grammatical point of view. Or I can use lexical cohesion. Let's look at some cases within the same text. The word night is repeated several times. It was a summer's night and they were talking in the big room with the windows open to the garden about the cesspool. The county council had promised to bring water to the village, but they hadn't. Mrs. Haynes, the white of a gentleman far farmer, a goose-faced woman with eyes protruding as if they saw something to gobble, to gobble in the gutter, said effectively, what a subject to talk about a night on a night like this. So we can see the repetition of the word night. Okay. And same thing then happens with several other features within the text. Um, then some examples of superordinates. Uh, again, this really depends on the text that you're going to analyze. Um, I have to change, the, probably I'm going to change the exam a little uh, based on this new situation. Um, but what I usually did last, week, last year is um, I gave you a range of 10 texts to study at home. And then um, I will randomly ask you to analyze one of them with the text. Um, um, looking at the text and taking notes. But anyway, just let me think about that. Uh, going back to the text here, superordinates. What a subject to talk about on a night like this. A nightingale, asked Mrs. Haynes, no. Nightingales did not come so far north. It was a daylight bird. In this case, um, actually, I wasn't supposed to highlight this, but this, nightingales, where bird is the superordinate for nightingales, okay? A word about general um, words. Um, in this case, you might have seen that um, Virginia Woolf uses the phrase, the sentence, the old, the phrase, sorry, uh, the old man in the armchair. Um, it is used at the beginning of the text, so we do not know who this person is in the beginning. It will be revealed gradually. So Virginia Woolf is pretty prone to using the technique of superordinates, but also general words, because she uses general words in the beginning, and then she slowly reveals uh, more details about the characters she uses, okay? So 
so for this text, for this um, class, sorry, we looked at the results of your test, the answers, um, and we got into part B of your book uh, on pragmatics that gives you some samples, some examples of how to analyze a text depending on what you've studied during the first part of um, your course that we covered in March. So um, the first two texts that we analyzed together, uh, one was on how to analyze context, depending on cultural background, situational context, um, and um, interpersonal context. And that was the text about the students. And then uh, the second text that we analyzed uh, was about Virginia Woolf and how to analyze uh, reference, and especially, more specifically, cohesion from uh, a grammatical point of view. So grammatical cohesion or lexical cohesion. Okay. Uh, this is that sort of class where I invite you to slow down, to pause the video every once in a while, and especially use the, the, the slides that I gave you, because it's more, it's better if you just read the text silently and find your own, uh, your own examples within the text, okay? Because this is just uh, a sample. Now, so as for today, we um, watched this TED talk about what, how you, you use language and what it says about you. Um, and that was the only video that we watched. And then the song for today is Vienna. So let me go to your links and thank you for sending me it. Slow down, you crazy child. You're so ambitious for a juvenile. But then, if you're so smart, tell me, why are you still so afraid? Where there's fire, where's the fire? Where's the hurry about? You better cool it off before you burn it out. You got so much to do and only so many hours in a day. But you know that when the truth is told, that you can get what you want, or you can just get old. You're gonna kick it a kick off before you even get half through, halfway through. When will you realize Vienna waits for you? Slow down, you're doing fine. You can't be everything you want to be before your time. Although it's so romantic on the borderline tonight. Too bad, but it's the life you lead. You're so ahead of yourself that you forgot what you need. Though you can see when you're wrong, you know you can't see, you can always see when you're right. You got your passion, you got your pride, but don't you know that only fools are satisfied? Dream on, but don't imagine they'll all come true. When you realize Vienna waits for you. When will you realize? Slow down, you crazy child. Take the phone off the hook and disappear for a while. <laughs> when you had hooks for phones. Um, it's all ready. Uh, it's all right. You can afford to lose a day or two. When will you realize Vienna waits for you? And you know that when the truth is told, that you can get what you want or you just get old. You're going to kick off before you even get halfway through. Why don't you realize Vienna waits for you? When will you realize Vienna waits for you? Okay, so you can go to the link that I posted right over here, link number two, and that I will put in the comment box below. Um, any problems, comments, suggestions, please send me an email or uh, write something in the comment box. Thank you, and um, see you next Monday. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.